Uh, good morning, Warriors. Great to be with you this morning. Uh, from those of you who are hoping to start a college career here in the next few months to those who are about to wrap up their college career here and then everybody in between, you are so, uh, we are so glad that you are here this morning, especially our guests. If you are joining us today, visiting Jessup, man, you are, you are our honored guest today and we're just humbled, thrilled that you are, are joining us. The rest of us have made a promise to be in our very best behavior, so we'll try to give a good impression today, uh, but, but there's no promises, there's no promises there. Uh, on that note, though, I need you to do me a favor before we continue. I need you to turn to the person on your right and say, I can't believe they would let someone like me into Jessup. Go ahead and say that now to the person next to you. But now I need you to turn to the person on the other side and say, but I really can't believe they'd let someone like you into Jessup. <laughs> Some of you just took way too much joy in that, right? I had too much fun with that. Hey, my name is Thomas Fitzpatrick. I'm the campus pastor here at Jessup, and I am thrilled to be able to share a word with you this morning. Hey, uh, before we continue, let's pray together. Let's ask God to join us in this space. Father, we love you so much, and it's because you love us so much, God. Amaze us this morning. Amaze us with your love overwhelm us with your love this morning. It's all we pray for, God. Your love changes everything. When you feel it, when you embrace it, when you receive it for the very first time, God, everything is different. And so we pray that happens this morning now. Amaze us with and in and through your love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. She wore my sweatshirt, even though it didn't, it didn't fit her at all. It looked rather foolish, even ridiculous on her. She shouldn't have been wearing it in the first place. But she wasn't wearing it to make a fashion statement. She wore it because it was mine. This semester here in chapel, we've been talking a lot about the word abound. This powerful truth that we see throughout the scripture that God desires for his people to live this full, abundant, amazing life. And not just in the stereotypical like churchy kind of ways, right? But he wants you to abound in every way from your interests to intimacy, from academics to athletics, God didn't send his son to die for us and then, and then put his spirit in us so we just have a teeny tiny bit more life than the rest of the world. He wants us to have a radically different experience of this life than the rest of the world. See, the father doesn't want you to just have peace from time to time or just when the college of your dreams says yes and throws you all kinds of scholarship money. Although we wouldn't be mad if they did, amen? No, God wants you to abound in peace. He wants you to have crazy, ridiculous amounts of peace, so much peace that you have it even when things aren't working out, even when things are falling apart and not, and not turning out the way you had planned. You abound in peace, so it doesn't matter what happens around you. The Father doesn't want you to be filled with gratitude, you know, from time to time or only around certain times of you like Thanksgiving where you're supposed to be thankful for things. He wants you to abound in gratitude. He wants you to have so much thankfulness and so much gratitude that you are thankful even when you don't have much to be thankful for when you are in plenty or when you are in want, when you're feeling blessed or when you're feeling totally beat down. He wants you to abound in gratitude. You with me? He wants us to abound in the qualities and the fruit of the Spirit. Crazy, limitless, lavish amounts of these things. Not just, just a little bit more. Like before I was a Christian, I was a two or three on the life is good scale. And now would you sound like a 3.5? Hey, nice. No, man, he wants, to, he wants to blow your life off the scale completely. That's his hope for you. And at the top of the list of the things that God wants you to abound in, it's love. It's love. First, uh, or Philippians 1.9, it is first Philippians, it's the only Philippians. Philippians 1.9 says this, and this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight. This is my prayer for you, that your love may abound. Amen. See, the great God of the universe, who is described multiple times throughout the scripture, especially in the Old Testament, as abounding in love, that, that God, he wants his children to abound in love as well. He wants his love to, to pour out of you. So it's like spilling out in every situation and in every relationship. He wants it to overflow everywhere you go. It reminds me of my girls. Uh, they are 10 and 6 right now, but for some reason, they still spill everything. I mean, parents, I don't know if you can relate to this, but if I'm not mopping up a mess after one of the three meals throughout the day, something just ain't right in the Fitzpatrick household. Like, are you, are you serious? 
Watch your elbow, watch your head, watch your knee. What are you doing? Well, that's actually how I think God wants it to be with our love. He wants us to spill it everywhere. Like, oops, I loved you. Oops, it's all over you again, my bad. Like, oh, there it is again. I just think he wants us to, to overflow with so much love that it goes on to everybody that we come into contact with. And this call to abound in love, it shouldn't come as a huge surprise to us. I mean, if you've read the Bible, like, ever, I mean, ever, 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 like one time in your whole life, you've probably seen that, that love is at the very core of Christianity. God's primary motivator in sending Jesus was love. John 3, 60, he so loved the world. He gave us Christ. The primary characteristic of a true follower of Jesus is love. John 13, 35, this is how the world will know you are mine, because you love one another. The only thing that has any value or any merit, any lasting impact, it's love. Galatians 5, 6, the only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through what? Love. The greatest thing we could ever do, the greatest thing we could ever show, the greatest thing we could ever give, it's love, 1 Corinthians 13, 13. The only thing that matters, right, the most important all, of all the things he lists, faith, hope, and love, the greatest of these is love. Hopefully you're seeing a little bit of a theme there. Love is a pretty big deal in God's eyes. Love is at the core of, of everything God does and at the heart of who God is, and thus as his followers, as those who take on his name, Love should be at the core of everything we do and the heart of everything that we are. Amen. We aren't called to show love every now and again. We aren't called to love others when it's convenient or easy or when they like us. We're called to abound in love, to have these crazy, lavish amounts of love. We love anybody and everybody, from my friends to my neighbors to my enemies. I can love everybody. I got so much of it to go around. In fact, according to 1 Corinthians 13, you could be a miracle worker in this world. I mean, you could do things this world has never seen the likes of ever before. You could start 10,000 nonprofit organizations. You could lead the biggest church in all of Sacramento, all the country, all the world for that matter. If you don't have God's love in you, if you don't abound in love, it doesn't matter at all. It doesn't matter at all. It all comes back to God's love. So how do you do that? I mean, in a world that is so filled with the opposite, so filled with anger, so filled with apathy, so filled with angst, in a world that's so hostile, so passive-aggressive, sometimes just flat-out aggressive, how do you abound in love? How do, you, how do you spill love out onto everybody? Well, she wore my sweatshirt, even though it didn't fit her at all. It looked rather foolish, even ridiculous on her. She shouldn't have been wearing it in the first place, but she wasn't wearing it to make a fashion statement. She wore it because it was mine. If you want to abound in God's love, you first have to be amazed by God's love. Amen. If you want to abound in God's love, you first have to be so amazed at God's love. We're going to zero in on one little verse this morning, but don't be fooled. Although he's, he's small and short in stature, he'll knock you across the face. First John 4.19 says this, we love because he first loved us. We love because of him, because of him and his love for us. I've been a campus pastor for a long time, and so I've been able to walk with a lot of students through their faith journey and faith development. And I kid you not, there's one difference between those students who are so on fire for the Lord and those who are not. There's one key difference between those who are, are excited about Jesus, want to live a life that's saturated by the Savior, who want more of the Spirit, who are like sharing their faith with everybody, and those we're just going through the motions, just kind of playing the game, cruising through their Christianity. There's one main difference, and the difference is this. Their amazement at God's love for them. Their amazement at God's love for them. Man, one group is like shoulder shrug. Yeah, God loves me, but he loves everybody. I'm not sure he really likes me all that much. And I'm not sure it really matters all that much. And the other group responds to God's love the way I responded the other day when I bit into, unsuspectingly bit into, a pickled jalapeno on my sandwich. Like, wow! You love me? Who put that in there? I'm gonna get you, chef. I'm gonna get you. But I kid you, the primary difference between those who are truly alive in Christ and those who are just asleep in Christ, the difference is their amazement at God's love for them. Again, 1 John 4, 19, we love because he first loved us. Think about that. 
there is a correlation there, isn't it? There's a causation there that, that it's profound. We need to pay close attention to it. We naturally hate. We naturally hurt. We naturally hide. Just ask Adam and Eve. We cannot love other people well or, or for the long haul on our own power, through our own willpower. We cannot do it. I cannot manufacture love for you. I cannot produce love for you. I have to receive love and then give you what I have been given. Does that make sense? So anytime you are loving anybody, anywhere, you're in your love in a Taco Bell special. I love Taco Bell. Anytime you love anything, you are just being a conduit of God's love. Something else is coming into you and pouring out of you. You love because of God. You love because of God's love. You, you, you cannot love without him. I want you to think back to the different ways that, that we show love over the course of our lives. When my daughters were little, I'm talking like one and three, they showed love by giving kisses. But, but, but at that age, though, a kiss was this like slobbery, snotty, wet, open mouth assault. I was like, like, okay, I love you too. And now for the sake of their future husbands, I am so glad they grew out of that. It was so gross. Uh, now that my daughters are in elementary school, they show me love uh, by making me things that they made me these two little things for Valentine's Day. I love you, daddy. Happy Valentine uh, to daddy. I love you, daddy. Hap Valentine's Day. I'm like, hap, is like hashtag for happy now? Or like, you talking short? Like perf, dad, hap, valentine? What the heck's going on here? When I was in elementary school, I showed love to the ladies by chasing them around the playground, right? <laughs> or, or you put notes, do you like me? Yes or no? Uh, please respond in pencil so I can reuse this if I don't like the answer, right? <laughs> in middle school, man, my friends and I used to write the, the person that we love, we'd, we'd write their name all over our binders. Does anybody do that anymore? Do y'all even have binders anymore? Like, is there an app for that? Like an app, like a binder app? Or back in middle school, we would put notes in their locker room right during passing period. And the girls, man, when I was in middle school, they would wrap those things up like they were some sort of like Chinese art form. It took me four hours to unwrap it and then decipher it, like turn over to the, I mean, this is so weird. And then who can forget junior high dances, man. It's a lot of love there. Woo. And every once in a while, a few brave soldiers would cross over into enemy territory. Some never to be seen again. Right. And then there's high school. Man, in high school, you show love by talking on the phone all hours of the night. You hang up. No, you hang up. I love you more. No, no, I love you more. Nowadays, I think you Snapchat or tweet or do some ridiculously elaborate pomposal. Anybody do a promposal up in here? All right, there's a few guys, a few romantics in here. But then there's my personal favorite. She wore my sweatshirt. Even though it didn't fit her at all. It looked rather foolish, even ridiculous on her. She shouldn't have been wearing it in the first place, but she wasn't wearing it to make a fashion statement. She wore it because it was mine. When I was a teenager, I worked at this little hole-in-the-wall cafe bakery called Aunt B's. Best caramel pecan sweet rolls you've ever had. After working there for about three months, I saved up enough money to buy a Tommy Hilfiger sweatshirt. It's actually this one right here. I don't know why I was dumb enough to pay $89 for this thing. <laughs> Sheesh. But I did. I love this little sweatshirt. Well, a few months into dating this girl named Rebecca. Got a picture here on the, on the screen. Uh, that beautiful girl on the right is Rebecca, now happens to be my wife, and that really good-looking guy on the left, yeah, that's me, y'all. And I am living proof that too much L.A. looks hair gel causes you to go from that to this. It's like public service announcement, okay? Well, a few months into dating this sweet thing, she asks if she can wear my sweatshirt. I'm like, my heel finger sweatshirt? Like my most prized possession, I cuddle up with this thing at night. No, you can't. Okay, ah, my sweatshirt. Well, she had my heart, so I handed it over. And many of us, we've experienced the same thing, haven't we? I mean, it could be a sweatshirt, a jersey, a T-shirt, maybe a Letterman jacket. It's like four or five sizes too big, but we wear them anyway. Why? Is it to look cool, to start a new trend for the approval of others? No, we do it for love. That's what love does. 
2 Corinthians 5.14 says love compels us. Love grabs you by the neck and says, you're going to do this, boy. It forces you to do things you wouldn't otherwise do. And so we rock the jersey, we sport the coat, we wear the jacket because we love the person to whom they belong. Right? We want to be as close to that other person as we possibly can. And so we claim and we wear their things as if they're our own. Now, I need you to hear something, friends. So if you've been watching like March Madness all morning or playing Candy Crush, just put it down just for a second. Just for a second. Because I need you to hear this. The creator of the universe loves you with all of his heart. He loves you like a googly-eyed groom loves his new bride. He loves you like a proud father loves his new precious children. He loves you like you are his most prized possession. And if you don't believe me, if you don't believe that his love for you is that real and that raw and that reckless and that good and that amazing, if you don't believe me, well, he bore the cross, even though it didn't fit him at all. It looked foolish on him, even ridiculous. He shouldn't have been wearing it in the first place. But he wasn't wearing it to make a fashion statement. He wore it because it was mine. Let that sink in for a minute. The great God of the universe wanted to be as close to you as he possibly could. And so he took what was yours and he wore it as if it were his own. You wouldn't do this for a pet. I don't care how cute your freaking cat is. <laughs> you wouldn't do this. You wouldn't make a sacrifice like this for a lab rat. You wouldn't go to this extreme for a business partner or a long lost relative, even a really good friend. You wouldn't do that. You would only go to that extreme and sacrifice your life in that way for the one who you love more than any other. I will only do that for the one I love more than any other. Amen. That's how God feels about you. And that's why he did what he did for you. It's only after we're convinced of God's love and convicted by God's love that we'll be changed by God's love to the point where we start to abound in God's love. It's only after we're amazed by God's love for us that we'll be able to abound in love for others. So if you're having a hard time right now, let me encourage you. If you're having a hard time loving your neighbor, if you're having a hard time loving your enemies, if you're having a hard time loving yourself, chances are you're not realizing and you haven't been totally wrecked by God's love for you. Because once you receive the one, you cannot help but do the other's. It will just pour in and pour out of you. I love 1 John 4.10. This is love, not that we loved God. Not, not, not what we do, not what we offer, but that he loved us and that he sent his son for us as an atoning sacrifice. It's all about what he did. Receive that, accept that, be overwhelmed by that, be wrecked by that, and you will start to abound in love in any and every situation. Amen. Let me invite the band up real fast. They got a great song for you this morning as we close out our time together. And really the point of the song is this, the point of the message is this, the depth and intensity of your love towards others is always and forever connected to your understanding of the depth and intensity of God's love for you. You with me? The depth and intensity in which you love others is gonna always be connected to how much you understand that God loves you. So when you run into somebody that loves, loves people so well, like, man, that guy's just loving everybody. He's so joyful, he's so excited. He's just abounding in love. That person has been totally changed by God's love. He has received it and has been wrecked by it, and now he just can't help but share it. And when you do that, man, I can love people that are so different from me, people that make me so angry, people that, that want to come after me. I can love all of them. I can abound in love. I don't care who you are. You're going to try to kill me? Well, they tried with Jesus. It didn't work. I can love you even if you hate my guts, even if you want to take my life. I can love you because I abound in it because that's how much he loves me. Y'all, I'm God's favorite. I'm sorry to tell you that, but he loves me a heck of a lot. He's probably got a picture of me right on his desk, like, what's up, kid? <laughs> but the same is true for you. Amen. You're his favorite. Yeah. He loves you so much. And that love is designed to change you, Amen. drastically and radically change you. So this is a new song. You may not have ever heard it before. So we're going to play it one time through, and then we have a few minutes extra. So play it once for us. Just sing over us, and then we're going to do it again, and I want you to sing along with it. Would that work? 
All right, listen to these words. 